Hi friends, welcome to Smart News Digital. In this video, we are going to have a newspaper analysis of a Hindu newspaper data 5th of July. Today we will have discussion on all these 8 topics. The first topic is related with internationalization of education. The term was first coined by Jane Knight, an academic in UK. The term means it is a process of integrating an international, intercultural or global dimension into the purpose functions or delivery of post-secondary education. So uh, what is the present status of education in India? Uh, we had in 2010 a, a committee headed by M.S. Swaminathan. He, say, he has opined that industries, higher education and employment are compartmentalized and disengaged. So he had given some proposals uh, the government is working on including those uh, proposals submitted by M.S. Swaminathan committee. So uh, we have added some, some data related to education in India. See India has third largest higher education system and the low rate of enrollment in higher education. It's a kind of inequality. Uh, India's vast population has a good number of young people in productive age, but only 35 million students are uh, enrolled in premier institutions of government. With the extent of open door policy, India has potential to become an educational hub in the near future. So the government intervention on institutions, academic structure of the institutions is eroding autonomy of institution. Also, apart from that, the bureaucratic and political shackles are restricting the growth of uh, educational institutions. Uh, with the advent of RTE, the primary enrollment has increased to a near universal enrollment. But uh, because of this, there is huge demand for higher education. Uh, we have to move in that direction to create avenues for higher education in India. Also, we have Indian students going abroad for higher education. The educational import, the higher educational import of Indian students accounts to 0.46% of India's GDP. And uh, comparing the status of India and China in attracting foreign students. China has more than 4 lakh foreign students studying in their universities, whereas India has only around 47,000 students, international students in uh, Indian universities. Also, uh, with the new advent of uh, study in India scheme and all, uh, the number is bound to increase. The global share of mobility as far as Indian educational uh, institutions are concerned is around 1 to 2 percentage. With uh, the government has also proposed to for institutions of eminence. With this scheme, the government has planned to increase the stature and quality of 20 Indian universities. And the major objective is to make these universities world class. From 2016, Ministry of Human Resource and Development, they have uh, started an initiative of ranking Indian universities based on NIRF. NIRF is National Institution uh, Ranking Framework. So uh, this has uh, created a space for improving quality of uh, institutions because now the data is transparent. So anybody can view the data in NIRF website. So uh, this will improve the quality of higher education. So as we said earlier, institutions of eminence scheme is trying to improve the quality of education in India by aiming to develop 20 universities into world class universities. Also, uh, uh, we have awarded uh, greater autonomy to public institutions. So this is also bound to increase the quality of higher education in India. So apart from all these initiatives, the government in the union budget 2018-19 has announced the RISE scheme, revitalizing infrastructure and systems in education. Apart from that, uh, we have also have higher education financing agency funding for uh, infrastructure development in uh, higher education institutions. Yesterday there was a news item about uh, HCFA financing around 1 lakh crore for developing infrastructure in uh, government schools, that is central government schools. And uh, as we discussed earlier, the, the politics and bureaucratization in education is uh, pulling down the growth of Indian educational system. So TSR Subramaniam committee in 2016 had uh, recommended to completely remove politics from educational institutions. So the author ends up by saying that internationalization is the central to academic uh, success in 21st century. Uh, the next topic is about the recent verdict given by uh, the Supreme Court defining the extent of power of uh, Lieutenant Governor as far as Delhi NSR is concerned. So uh, we all know that Delhi has been accorded a special status under Article 239 AA of Indian Constitution. Uh, and as per 239 AA, Delhi has been accorded with a Lieutenant Governor who is an agent of President. So, uh, what is the role of Lieutenant Governor? The roles of Lieutenant Governor has been clearly defined in this uh, Article 239 AA. But there have been a few cases of uh, overarching power being exerted by the Lieutenant Governor. This has been uh, put under question in uh, various uh, fora of uh, judicial system. In 2016, uh, Delhi government filed a case in uh, Delhi High Court 
the case was basically uh, against the lieutenant governor's over exertion of power what the lieutenant governor do he uh, sat on the government files uh, citing the uh, power vested upon him under article 239a section 4 uh, the lieutenant governor has been provided with the power to withhold the government decisions on any matter so citing this the lieutenant governor uh, uh, won the case against the uh, delhi government then the delhi government moved to the supreme court the present verdict was given by supreme court on this case the supreme court verdict said that the lieutenant governor is bound by the aid and advice of uh, advice of the elected representatives of uh, delhi government and he can withhold certain decisions of the government only in cases which are to be reserved for presidential assent the delhi government has also defined the extent of any matters as defined in uh, article 239 aa section 4 the justice chandra sood has opined that the uh, any matter does not mean uh, all trivial matters so it has curtailed the powers of lieutenant governor uh, the another opinion of jury was that the powers of lg is confined to the matters of constitutional uh, relevance so this is the crux of the issue cji while offering the verdict uh, he referred to balakrishnan report of 1987 which uh, uh, balakrishnan report of 1987 had stated that delhi is not a state delhi is a special territory accorded with national capital region uh, status so what does the balakrishnan report of 1987 says as we discussed earlier delhi is not a state control of union over delhi is vital in national interest that's why it has been uh, designated as national capital region so uh, when we have two different governments say the delhi government being run by another party and the central government union being run by another political party it is bound to create some uh, dissent between the parties which is not good for uh, a region which houses important officers of uh, our country and it will prejudice the national interest also the report uh, opined that when delhi becomes full fledged state there would be constitutional division of sovereign legislative and executive powers between union and the state of delhi and uh, parliament uh, the, uh, the report also says that the parliament would have limited legislative access and that too only in special and emergency situations the third topic is uh, about nipa virus so what is nipa virus nipa virus is a zoonotic uh, virus and uh, who has classified it as a category 4 disease and this places it in the uh, equal status of ebola so the genome of uh, nipah virus has been decoded and the genome has been decoded through reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction test so how does nipah virus spread it was first found in malaysia in uh, 1998 so how does it spread any viral disease needs a vector the primary vector is uh, fruit bats from fruit bats it goes to pigs or to the fruits which have been off bitten by the fruit bats and either by the off bitten fruits or by the pigs the virus is transmitted to humans so uh, why is it a news recently icmr has found that the fruit bat was the source of nipah outbreak in india so uh, the recent outbreak in uh, kerala took 16 lives this was not the first outbreak in india rather it is the third outbreak the earlier outbreak was uh, through bangladesh in west bengal and parts of odisha in uh, bangladesh and in uh, west bengal this was mainly due to the consumption of uh, date palm sap toddy whereas uh, in kerala the consumption of date palm sap toddy is not very common so uh, the transmission route is still unclear so what is the concern for uh, public health in india the government should uh, start wider surveillance of animal reservoirs of disease research has been undertaken to curtail the menace of nipah virus by collaboration between center for infectious disease research and policy university of minnesota and who the next topic is about isro's pad abort test uh, we all know that uh, isro is uh, planning to launch man into space through human space flight program so in that context this pad abort test becomes more crucial what is this uh, pad abort test it is aborting a space capsule at launch to save the inmates see uh, now we have witnessed uh, well during the time of launch certain launchers explode and uh, it causes damage to the satellites and other uh, hardware materials present in the uh, launch vehicle but consider the scenario uh, indian space scientists are sitting inside the capsule in a satellite launch vehicle so what if it explodes so in order to restrict the damage uh, restrict the damage to human lives during the time of uh, uh, human space flight isro has uh, proceeded further with this pad abort test so this is the first milestone of isro in uh, crew escape system and uh, this test is uh, not manned it is unmanned test it is designed to validate the launch escape system it will carry the spacecraft and its crew to safety in the event of major malfunctions during the early stages of future manned launches 
The test is also one of the many main supporting technologies developed ahead of the ambitious human space flight program. The next topic is about India-Nepal relations. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Oli of uh, Nepal, he recently visited China for the second time and his visit has been hailed as success across all quarters. So, uh, he first visited China in 2016. This coincided with Indian blockade along the uh, Indo-Nepal border. Because of this, uh, the fuel uh, and uh, other raw materials supplied from, Ind from, the si from Indian side to Nepal got uh, a blockade, got obstructed and uh, uh, Nepal people uh, suffered a lot because of this. And this marked an uh, epoch in shift of uh, Nepal from India to China. Uh, the author also says that uh, there is a growing uh, nationalist anti-Indian tendency in Nepal. He gives two factors for this growing anti-Indian uh, tendency in Nepal. What is that? First, this India's blockade. Uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, it marked the epoch in India-Nepal relationship and this uh, reservations over constitution making. India had certain reservations over constitution making and because of that, they believe that India blockaded the uh, trade routes into Nepal. And this and alienation of young Nepalis. Earlier, young Nepalis used to study in India. Now, they have found other alternative destinations for education. So, this has also alienated India Nepalis from India. Nepal is historically India locked. That is, Nepal needs India for any uh, for sea transit. Any sovereign country uh, does not want to depend on a single source for the sea transit. So, it has uh, for Nepal it had become an issue to be resolved. So, after 2016, Prime Minister Oli managed to push transit and trade agreement with China. And uh, apart from India, almost all of South Asian countries are part of Belt and Road Initiative. The China views Nepal as a conduit to the Indian markets and China is helping to construct railways, roadways, transmission lines, optical fiber network between Nepal and China. Also, uh, the development of railways and uh, roadways will help in economic development of Nepal. So, the author says that it is the time has uh, become ripe for India to recalibrate the relations with Nepal. What is the major concern from the side of Nepal? The major concern is about the open borders. India has to factor in the open borders while uh, proceeding uh, for the dialogue process. Nepal has evolved from being the uh, being under the wings of India, both politically and economically. And uh, considering this, India should be proactive in uh, Nepal relations. The author concludes by saying that India should use this chance to write another chapter on bilateral and geopolitical history. So, uh, the next topic is related with the veracity of claims made by uh, Central Statistical Organization on the growth of uh, employment in India. So, uh, Central Statistical Organization released employment data in May 2018 in which it has claimed that uh, India has created more than 4.1 million jobs last year. That is 4.1 million formal jobs during last year. So, the data, whenever we speak about uh, employment data or anything, we need to factorize the base of data. And the data calculated by CSO was based on only for 15 percentage of Indian workforce that is for based on formal sector. Uh, the report of CSO is titled as Payroll Reporting in India, an Employment Perspective. 4.1 million new jobs in the formal sector. And uh, the CSO has uh, defined formal employment based on the enrollments in uh, Employee Provident Fund, Employee State Insurance Fund and National Pension Scheme Enrollment. If you remember, there was controversy on the same topic during uh, December and it, also, it claimed that India's uh, formal sector job growth has increased enormously. This, that was also based on social security based calculations and this also reflected in uh, uh, Economic Survey 2017-18. So, the official estimates, they exclude the informal sources. The informal sources make 85% of Indian workforce but they are excluded from the estimates made by the government. Uh, the author says that social security based assessment is unreliable on two fronts. One is veracity of data and second is double counting. A same employee uh, could be member of uh, both uh, social security organizations and there are chances of double counting. And apart from this, under uh, Pradhan Mantri Rozgar Protoshan Yojana, other schemes initiated by state governments, uh, the government is contributing for the uh, employer's uh, share in uh, EPF. So, this has increased the this has increased the uh, expense of uh, EPF. So, this is an artificial inflation created by government schemes. And as we all know, this formal sector is the apex of labor permit in India. 
we have 85 percentage of informal workforce in uh, base of the permit the formal sector is just 15 percentage forming apex of the labor permit and of that uh, 85 percentage informal workforce 50 percentage are from uh, agriculture sector the author has also opened that uh, the non-form informal sector we have uh, form contributing for 50 percentage of the total 85 percent informal sector we have another 35 percentage of non-form informal sector this non-form informal sector has been growing in the past decade this in, in non-form informal sector has witnessed many degrees varying degrees of underemployment or disguised unemployment earlier the government source for uh, checking the employment data was employment unemployment surveys or, uh, conducted by national sample survey now uh, the government has uh, from 2011 12 the government has stopped issuing the stop uh, conducting uh, this EUS service that is employment unemployment service this uh, the EUS database offered a valuable purpose of capturing the complexities of labor market access to household level data and this has uh, given the scope for having a granular access granular analysis of employment data but with the stopping of conduct of this survey Available of data has hit the quality of assessing employment status in India. As you said earlier, the UES is replaced with annual labor force survey and time use survey. Uh, the Labor Bureau under Ministry of Labor has been conducting household surveys somewhat closer to the uh, employment unemployment survey of 2010-11. These household surveys conducted by the government of India shows a declining worker population ratio which has been depicted in the uh, slide here. And, uh, declining worker population ratio shows that the employment growth in India is lagging behind. Normally, uh, in the terms of economy, uh, we will tend to understand that when the, whenever the GDP is growing, availability of jobs will also grow. But the author says that due to the faulty calculation methods of national account statistics method, the growth rate of GDP has been uh, inflated and because of this, the uh, which, which is not reflecting the growth of uh, employment sector in India. The author also says that the growth of manufacturing sector as uh, mentioned in IIP uh, index of industrial production and annual survey of industry is far lower than the data given in the GDP estimation. So the author says that uh, the CSO's claim on job creation is questionable on empirical and conceptual considerations. The author categorically opines that the data is about enrollment in social sector schemes not about generation of employment. As we said earlier the formal the official data uh, contributes to official data is based only on 15 percentage of India's labor force that is formal sector. There is no proper availability of data for the remaining major part of Indian workforce that is 85 percentage of informal sector. The author, uh, author concludes by saying that time tested US data is required for uh, assessing the uh, um, unemployment and other unemployment underemployment happening in non-form non -form informal uh, employment in India. The next topic is about uh, the implications of uh, Katsa Act on uh, relationship between India. So Katsa, what is Katsa? Katsa is countering aggressors of uh, Katsa is countering adversaries of America through Sanctions Act. So uh, based on uh, as per Katsa, any countries having uh, trade contact with Iran, Russia, and North Korea will face serious implications from US. And uh, now, we, uh, now we consider the implications of uh, the Kautsa Act between India and Iran. So Iran is, uh, India is the second largest oil purchaser from Iran. Also, in February 2018, India has proposed to increase the oil import from Iran by 25%. So, this, apart from this, we also have our strategic Chabahar port in Iran, which is crucial for India to counter the Belt and Road or OBO initiatives of China. Now, it's up to the uh, postponed 2 plus 2 dialogue mechanisms to decide upon India's relationship with Iran as far as oil and uh, strategic Chavar port are concerned. So the next topic is about DNA technology use and application built 2018. 
th this uh, DNA technology will speaks about creation of uh, DNA profiles and a uh, DNA storage bank. This uh, DNA technology bill allows creation of DNA profiles and uh, storing this DNA profiles in a specific DNA storage bank for the purpose of forensic applications. So, uh, uh, this bill is limited, this DNA, this DNA profiling is limited to forensic and criminal applications, but the, uh, since the bill is in a, uh, since this is only in a bill stage, the potential implications on privacy has to be discussed further. Thank you.